Genesis 37. I'm just going to read the first uh, four verses here and then just offer a brief prayer before we get into it. Genesis 37, 1. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. These are the family records of Jacob. At 17 years old, Joseph tended sheep with his brothers. The young man was working with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel, that's Jacob, loved Joseph more than his other sons because Joseph was a son born to him in his old age, and he made a robe of many colors for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not bring themselves to speak peaceably to him. This is the word of the Lord. Our Father in heaven, please open our eyes to see Jesus, strengthen our hearts to believe in him, and strengthen our will to follow him wherever he leads. We pray this in his name. Amen. Uh, Genesis 37 gives us the perfect picture of a dysfunctional family. Jacob and his sons are a complete mess. If they moved into your neighborhood, you will be putting the for sale sign out front. <laughs> Tellingly, this passage has 20 occurrences of the word brother, zero occurrences of the word God. This story is a story about a family devoid of God's love. One skeptic of the Bible writes this. The Old Testament, Cain slays his brother, Lot sleeps with his daughters, Joseph's siblings sell him into slavery. It's a wonder family values advocates let their kids read this book. Maybe you're wrestling with the Bible and its truthfulness, and you're wondering, do, do passages like these discredit the Bible? Not one bit. I think unflattering passages like Genesis 37 actually show off the Bible's truthfulness. And I think passages that are grimy and messy and gritty like this give us two things, honesty and hope. What other religious books almost fixates on the ugly side of its heroes? The Bible is honest on our human nature. At the same time, what other book provides hope for dysfunctional and downtrodden folks. Only the Bible, as it points us to Jesus. One thing that skeptic missed on the Bible is that the Bible is a book for the broken. Inside of it, the broken are pointed to Jesus to be made whole. So in this passage, we're gonna see a lot of dysfunction. Favoritism, boasting, bitterness, deceit, all of us can relate to some part of this brokenness in our own lives, but there is hope. We're going to step back and look at this passage in the big story of the Bible, and we'll see that God restores ruined families through the love of Jesus. This is true of the nuclear family. If your own family is a mess, this is true of the family of God. God restores ruined families through the love of Jesus. So let's look at these first four verses and look at a father's favorite here. To catch us up to speed, this story, the Joseph story, is explaining big picture to the Israelites how they ended up in Egypt. And as we've been going through Genesis, we've looked at the life of Abraham, we've looked at the life of Jacob, and now we're looking at the life of Joseph. And each one of these fathers in the faith teaches us a huge lesson. Abraham teaches us about faith. Jacob teaches us about reliance. And Joseph teaches us about God's providence how he works all things for his good purposes. So here's a bit of background on Jacob. He's finally made it home after being away for 20 years. He's lost his favorite wife, Rachel. She died in childbirth. And here he has family strife, even though he's made it to his homeland. And he hasn't learned his lesson. He still gives in to this pattern of favoritism in his life. Consider favoritism in Jacob's life. His parents had favorites. He was his mom's favorite. He had a favorite wife, Rachel, not Leah. And now he has a favorite son, Joseph. Jacob doesn't even seem to hide his favoritism at all. He gives, he gives Joseph this beautiful robe of many colors, and he doesn't give it to any of his sons. Um, as the kids say today, he gave Jacob, uh, Joseph the drips. 
He was drippy in his robe. So this robe was costly. It was beautiful. It was almost regal or royal in a sense. And he only gives it to Joseph, showing off his favoritism. But favoritism wreaks destructive fruit in his life. Think about it. His parents' favoritism split up their family for 20 years. His own favoritism of Rachel added tension into his home life. And now his favoritism for Joseph leads to the bitter fruits of division, competition, and bitterness. And as a father, Jacob was not representing his heavenly father well. The God we worship is a father with no favorites. You may be looking around and thinking, really? God doesn't play favorites? What about that other person who has every single blessing that I don't have? What about that brother or sister who has that job or that ability or that relationship that I don't have? God doesn't play favorites? That's what scripture teaches. Look at 1 Peter 3.17. I like the NLT here. And remember that the heavenly father to whom you pray has no favorites. If you are believing in Jesus, we all have his ear in prayer. We all have the promise of heaven. We all have the Holy Spirit. We all have spiritual gifts to use for the building up of the body. And we all share his full and his free love. God has no favorites. And yes, as a good, wise father, sometimes he will withhold certain things from us. But it's not out of favoritism at all. It's because he's wise and loving. And he knows your particular needs. And in all things, he offers himself fully and freely to you. So if we have a father without any favorites, what does it look like for us to be a family without favorites? I think it looks like moving towards people in this community who don't look like us and think like us. I think it looks like showing everyone respect in conversation. I saw an example of this at one church I was uh, visiting in Kennebunk where one of the pastors just knelt down and talk to the kids face to face, eye to eye. I think being a family without favorites looking, looks like praying for all the saints, praying for those we don't know well as we see those prayer requests funnel through the emails and on Sundays. And I think it looks like welcoming whoever God chooses to send to our church. We don't have control on who Jesus is gonna save. We're gonna welcome them with open arms. I think there's a word here for parents, and I'm preaching to myself here, but what does it look like to be a parent without favoritism? I think it looks like showing the same compassion to each child, no matter how rowdy or wild they're acting. I think it means that we're just in our assumptions. You've probably experienced this if you're a parent, but if you're upstairs and you hear commotion in the basement, you're tempted to yell that one name. But parents, we're called to judge justly to not have any favorites. And I think it looks like parents showering our kids with grace, gifts, dates, and affection, not based on their performance. For you kids, for you older siblings, it looks like inviting your younger siblings into your conversations, into your play. And so we're a family without favorites. Now you might be thinking, what about having best friends? What about having a closer circle of friends? Well, Jesus had 12 disciples. Three of them were a bit closer to him. But catch this. His love for the three didn't diminish his love for the other nine. So you could have close friends. You could have best friends within this church or outside. But that should not diminish your love for the others in your church. So becoming a new family starts with imitating our father, our heavenly father, not having any favorites. We're called to be a community that loves everyone impartially in Jesus' name. And so we're to reject the sin of favoritism. And next, we're supposed to avoid the sin of boasting. Look at a brother's boast in verse five. Verse five. Then Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. So there we were, binding sheaves of grain in the field. Suddenly, my sheaf stood up, and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Are you really going to reign over us, his brothers asked him? Are you really going to rule us? So they hated him even more because of his dream 
and what he had said. Then he had another dream and told it to his brothers. Look, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun, moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. He told his father and brothers and his father rebuked him. What kind of dream is this that you've had? He said, am I and your mother and your brothers really going to come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So Joseph has these two dreams. One includes sheaves, bound up wheat, another stars. And in both of them, they're bowing down to Joseph. Uh, He has this dream two times. Maybe God is emphasizing something through these. And he's saying, my father, my mother, at this point, his mother Rachel's dead, so it's probably his adoptive mother Leah, and my brothers are going to bow down to me. Now, these are good dreams. We're going to see that they come from God, but this is pretty poor delivery. He's like that typical teenage brat. He's acting foolishly. Uh, He knows his brothers are already jealous of him, and he's kind of egging them on. And the narrator in the section doesn't tell us if he's sinful or not. But it seems like, even though the dream is true, he's speaking in a spirit of boasting. And I think we can know this because later on, he interprets two dreams, and he gives credit to God. But here, he doesn't give credit to anyone. He just has these dreams and boasts of them to his family. Joseph is a brother who enjoys blessings, but he doesn't bless others at this point. He simply boasts. We get the sense that Joseph kind of enjoys his sense of privilege and he's egging on his brothers to envy. But Jesus is a different brother entirely. Jesus, like Joseph, shared the love of his father. But Jesus, unlike Joseph, shares the blessing with others. I love this. If you look at the word beloved in most of your translations, it's used eight times in the Gospels, only of Jesus. In the rest of the New Testament, it's used dozens and dozens of times, almost always to refer to Christians, men and women who've placed their faith in Jesus. What is that telling us? Jesus, God's beloved, invites brothers and sisters into the love of the Father. And we are called to imitate our big brother, Jesus. We are to go from boasting to blessing others with the blessings we have received. And over the next several sermons, we'll see the growth That happens in Joseph's life. He will go from boasting over his brothers to blessing his brothers. And this is the path of growth that Jesus has us on. And so I wonder, what blessings and gifts has God given you? What particular blessings has God placed in your life? What would it look like to invite brothers and sisters into that blessing? Thinking back on my over two years at ROG, it'd be hard to list all the ways ROG members have blessed me and my family, but here's a little list. These are some of the blessings, the gifts you have used to bless me and my family. Wise financial counsel, wise life counsel, help with installing a ceiling fan, help with installing a new faucet, I'm not super handy. Uh, Prayer, a listening ear, words of encouragement, babysitting, Discovery Cove and nursery for the kiddos, delicious meals, and I could go on and on. What are those an example of? These people didn't boast of their great skill, but they used their skill to bless. And I think that's what Jesus is calling to us, calling us to in this text. We are to be a family that uses our gifts, not to boast, but to bless. And so Jacob's favoritism Joseph's boasting created this toxic brew. And the brothers started getting antsy. They started getting bitter and revengeful at Joseph. And what we see next is that these brothers commit a crime against their brother. Let's look at verse 12 for this bitter vengeance. A bitter vengeance, verse 12. His brothers had gone to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, your brothers you know, are pasturing the flocks of Shechem. Get ready. I'm sending you to them. I'm ready, Joseph replied. Then Israel said to him, go and see how your brothers and the flocks are doing and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the Hebron Valley and he went to Shechem, then to Dothan. If you skip ahead to verse 18. His brothers saw him in the distance and before he had reached them, they plotted to kill him. They said to one another, oh, look, here comes that dream expert. 
So now, come on, let's kill him, throw him in one of the pits. We can say that a vicious animal ate him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to save him from them. He said, let's not take his life. Reuben also said to them, don't shed blood. Throw him into this pit in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him, intending to rescue him from them and return him to his father. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped off Joseph's robe, the robe of many colors that he had on. Then they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty without water. They sat down to eat a meal. And when they looked up, there was a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were carrying aromatic gum, balsam, and resin going down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what do we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come on, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When Midianite traders passed by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the pit and sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took Joseph to Egypt. These are some bitter, vengeful brothers. Joseph travels a long distance, about 50 miles or so, to check on their well-being. And while his intentions are to see how they're doing, their intentions are murderous to kill him. And it seems like two of his brothers, his older brothers, Reuben and Judah, have good intention. But as we look a little bit deeper, both of them are just trying to preserve their own reputation. Reuben says, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him or throw him in a pit. But he'd recently slept with one of his father's concubine, and he wants to return Joseph back to his father just to receive his good graces. And Judah, listen to his reasoning. He says, what do we gain? if we kill our brother. And this is a sign of a dysfunctional family. A dysfunctional family does not love genuinely, but only loves to receive. Reuben and Judah didn't really seem to have Joseph's safety in mind. If they did, they would have rejected any plans to hurt him at all or sell him into slavery. They have a self-preserving love in mind. And notice this key detail in verse 25. It says, they sat to eat a meal. Their coolness amidst what they just did to their brother is chilling. They have no remorse, no anxiety that tears them up. They actually sat down and ate a meal while their brother was at the bottom of a pit. And then they send him off into slavery. Now, as we go through this story, we're not only going to see Joseph transform, we're going to see his brothers transform from being bitter and hard-hearted to loving. And that change is going to come when they encounter the grace of Joseph, their brother. And that change is going to happen for us as we encounter the grace and love of our older brother, Jesus Christ. If you consider the similarities between Jesus and Joseph, they're stunning. Joseph was misunderstood and hated by his brothers. So was Jesus. They thought he lost his mind. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver by one of, uh, one of his own. Both were put into a pit. Both were raised to glory. More on this later for Joseph. Both extend grace and love to their brothers. And as they encounter the love and grace of Joseph, and as we encounter the love and grace of Jesus, even though we put him on the cross, we will be transformed into a loving family. So we've seen that this dysfunctional family shows favoritism. They show boasting and bitterness. And now we see they're filled with lies. These brothers go back to deceive their dad. Look at verse 29 with me. At this deceived dad. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. So apparently Reuben had gone off, come back, and he thought they killed Joseph but they hadn't. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy is gone. What am I going to do? So they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a male goat, and dipped the robe in its blood. They sent the robe of many colors to their father and said, we found this. Examine it. Is it your son's robe or not? His father recognized it. It's my son's robe, he said. A vicious animal has devoured him. Joseph has been torn to pieces. Then 
Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth around his waist, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will go down to Sheol to my son, mourning. And his father wept for him. Verse 36. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and the captain of the guards. The sons come back. They lie to their father. They take the blood of a goat and put it all over Joseph's robe. And this is a bitter irony for jo Jacob. Because remember, he deceived his father Isaac with skins from a goat. Now his own sons are deceiving him with blood from a goat. And he's led to think that Joseph is dead. This family holds a faux funeral. This is mafia movie type stuff. This is like Godfather Sopranos type stuff. Imagine as Jacob is mourning the death of Joseph, his son, the sons are sneaking glances behind their father, nodding at each other knowingly, knowing what they did. They're callous in their crimes. And they've broken the foundation of family, which is trust. They lied to their dad. What must have Jacob been thinking? Think about this. This is later in Jacob's life. He's finally made it home. He lost Rachel, his favorite wife. Now he's lost Joseph, at least in his mind, his favorite son. Maybe he felt deceived by God. He would have been tempted to doubt God's promise of blessing on him and his family with all this ruin. Maybe you're in a season of life that you've been walking with God for decades and now it seems like he's fallen silent. And yet this passage continue, continues. Look at verse 36 with me. There's a pregnant word, meanwhile. Meanwhile. While Jacob is mourning the loss of those dearest to him, meanwhile, God is still up to something good. God is always some, up to something in our confusion. We may not know what he is doing, but in his providence, there's always a meanwhile for good. Where was God in Jesus' story? Imagine being a disciple, not Jacob, but being a disciple in Jesus' story, walking with him for three years, leaving your family, leaving your job, putting everything, all your eggs in one basket with Jesus, and then he's crucified. Meaningless suffering on a Friday. And on silent Saturday, as tradition calls it, you're wrecked. You're hopeless. All your hope was in Jesus. All your hope was in this Savior, this King, to bring peace to earth. And now he's gone. Think about all the questions the disciples must have asked. Where is God in all this suffering? And yet there was a meanwhile in Jesus' story. Though Jesus died on a cross, meanwhile, God used that to take away our sins. And on Sunday morning, he would raise Jesus Christ to invite all who would believe in him into a new family. And that's what he's doing this morning. If you are sick of the dysfunction in your life, if you are sick of deceit, of boasting, of strife between each other and between God, you are welcomed into the family of God. If you place your faith in Jesus Christ, he brings you into his family. And even through your suffering, though it seems meaningless, there's always a meanwhile. God is up to something. This week, I listened to an audio book, uh, The Hillbilly Elegy. In it, the author, uh, J.D. Vance, he explains his story and the story of his people called white trash or hillbillies, basically poor white folks, especially in the Appalachian region of our country. And Vance, he's a self-proclaimed hillbilly even though he graduated from Yale. Um, he grew up in Appalachia, and then he moved to Ohio's Rust Belt. And he tells the story of growing up with dysfunction all around him, just eating junk. There's something called Mountain Dew Mouth, where the kids would just drink and drink soda, and they would lose their teeth. Um, it was normal at home for him to have screaming matches, throwing dishes, violent threats. There was instability in his home, and it was the norm. His mother was an addict, and she would just rotate through boyfriends. And he remarks that he once visited a family member's house, and it was super weird. The house was peaceful. 
It was super abnormal for where he grew up. Later, when he started dating a young lady at Yale, he went over to her house for a break, and he was talking to her father. And while he was talking to her father, an estranged family member got brought up in conversation, and J.D. Vance just kind of leaned in, waiting for his future father-in-law just to tear this dude apart. But instead, the father spoke about the estranged family member with compassion and even sadness. These experiences with healthy families were vital in changing Vance's perspective on family life. They gave him a vision of what life could be. He, he went back and kind of thought about the families in his life that made it out of the cycle of addiction and abuse. And he found a common denominator. Him, his sister, and an aunt made it out into healthy lives. And the common denominator was they married someone who is stable and a healing presence. How much more can that be said of us, the church? What makes us Christians who bring our own dysfunction into the church healthy and stable? We have been married to the Lord Jesus Christ, the ultimate stable and peaceful presence. Or to put it another way in light of this passage, what restores a dysfunctional family? the introduction of a new family member, a better brother, Jesus Christ. Jesus is a brother who shows no favorites. He doesn't boast. He doesn't grow bitter no matter how many times you think you fail him. And he'll never lie to you. He'll always speak the truth in love. In a world of increasing dysfunction, broken families, church families that sadly aren't much different, God is taking dysfunctional families as his raw material. Messes like Jacob's family are actually what God takes to be the building blocks of his kingdom. David pointed this out in sermon collaboration, that the 12 sons of Jacob, these sons, Joseph and the ones who threw him in the pit, have their names inscribed on the 12 gates of heaven. These messy men are what God builds his kingdom with. And this is our hope as God's people, that God restores broken families through the love of Jesus.